this lecture is going to be on the Enlightenment and Neoclassicism. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, I'm going to give you a bit of background for Neoclassicism. So remember where we've come from. We've just been in the Rococo, okay? Um, we were discussing the Baroque and then the Rococo and how frivolous it was. Um, the Baroque being focused on aggrandizing, um, particularly uh, non-Dutch Baroque is what we're talking about right now. So the French Baroque, right? Think of the portrait of the Sun King, okay? And how uh, heavy and weighty and grand that image was. Um, and then think of the Rococo and how fun and frivolous it was. And at the same time, we're going to be talking about something called the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is um, roughly 1715 to 1789, but it's really late 18th to early 19th century. And it's scientific advances fostering intellectual and moral reforms by acquiring knowledge and applying reason. So what we're looking at here is by Joseph Wright of Darby, and you are seeing uh, a philosopher lecturing on the orrery. And so what that means is that this is a model of the universe, okay? And so um, we're going to see this emphasis on knowledge and reason and logic and learning and education and the ancients, okay? So we're going to see um, some of the principles of humanism coming back to the forefront. And as I just said, there's a real admiration for the restraint and the harmony of classical art. And there was this belief that work could morally improve the viewer, not viewing artistic work, but actual work. And the Enlightenment is primarily focused in England and France. Basically, the idea is that you learn through empirical observation and scientific experimentation. Okay, so look at these figures here. Again, they're studying this model of the universe. And you can see that they're still wearing wigs, but this is a much more subdued sort of image. Um, and we have a lot of the tenebrism from Caravaggio, so there is still some drama, but it is much more intellectually focused. So um, let me, sorry, give me just one sec. Um, and so you can see here the philosopher who is lecturing and you have even children attending this lecture. So this is also when we see Isaac Newton, um, who is encouraging keeping science to the physical realm rather than looking at the supernatural. So this is a movement away from mysticism, okay? Um, and we also have Locke, the philosopher, who was born at this time, and he believes that humans are born good, not that they're cursed with original sin. So you're not looking at this concept of predestination and needing to do good works in order for salvation, right? He believes that knowledge comes through sensory perception of the material world and that people have natural rights and the government is to protect those rights. If the government abuses those rights, people have the right of revolution. And he believes that the ills of humanity could be remedied by applying common sense and reason. So he believes in what's called the doctrine of progress. So rather than the future being inevitable, a cycle of life and death with religious beliefs determining fate, he believes instead that humans advance by degrees to a happier state by accumulating and propagating knowledge. Okay, um, so I'm going to continue talking about the Enlightenment, but just to give you um, some other images. So this is called an experiment on a bird in the air pump, 1768, same artist. And it's the concept of um, oxygen running out in this uh, bubble. And so you can see these people attending this experiment. Um, okay, so this belief that um, you are not predestined by religion and that people have natural rights and the government is to protect those rights. This gives birth to the French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution in England. And the next lecture is going to be talking about romanticism. So it's also worth noting that this philosophy gives birth to the idea of manifest destiny as well. 
Um, and so Voltaire, another philosopher, believes that humans can't be happy until an enlightened society removes traditional obstructions to progress of the human mind. So basically, humanity can be saved by advancement of science and rational improvement of society. And then we have Rousseau, um, who believes that the arts and sciences and society and civilization have corrupted natural man. And the only salvation would be through return to ignorance, innocence, and happiness of original condition. Man is by nature good. He's depraved and perverted by society. And so rejecting the idea of progress um, and honoring a simple life as honest and unsullied uh, in terms of emotions. So peasants are the ideal here. So we have some conflicting beliefs, um, but these all contribute to the culture at this time. So let me continue moving forward. Um, and what I wanna highlight is this, um, this print. And basically it tells you how to make artificial pearls, which, okay. But what's important is that this is from an encyclopedia or dictionary on the sciences, arts, and other um, forms, okay? And so it is engaged in looking at creation of all these different objects and explaining them. So you have the science and the knowledge that goes into this, as well as elements of the Industrial Revolution, right? So you have this machinery here for making the pearls, and above you see the women engaged in pearl making, etc. Um, so Diderot, is the editor of this encyclopedia, and it's a massive undertaking, okay? Um, so it is volumes and volumes. I'm trying to see if um, 11 volumes of plates uh, at, for a total of 28 volumes, okay? So this is the same individual who says of the Rococo, quote, it is the ruination of all young apprentice painters barely able to handle a brush and hold a palette, they torture themselves stringing together infantile garlands, painting chubby crimson bottoms and hurl themselves headlong into all kinds of follies, which cannot be remedied by originality, fire, tenderness, nor by any magic in their models, for they lack all of these. Okay, so you can see how there is this real repugnance for the Rococo. I particularly like the painting chubby crimson bottoms um, because they're not wrong. They're not wrong. So again, the Industrial Revolution has this enlightenment emphasis on scientific investigation and technological invention. Um, and this is the time when we are discovering the power of steam and um, machinery, okay? And so this is the notion of progress. Now there is, um, sort of a, a halfway point between uh, the Rococo and the Baroque and neoclassicism, which is where we're headed to. And this is called natural art. So this is based on Rousseau, the one who believes that emotions come before reason and we need to revert back to an earlier state. Okay, so this is a taste for the natural versus the artificial and the frivolous in the arts. So we still have really sentimental themes. This is a female artist, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Brun, and this is a portrait of Marie Antoinette. And we're going to be talking about Marie Antoinette a little bit more when we talk about the French Revolution. So we're depicting frivolous clothing. Um, the locations are a little bit less frivolous, but the people themselves are not frivolous. They're serious and self-confident, and the artwork itself is forceful and graceful. So you can see how there's still this element of sentiment from the Rococo, but um, you can see it in like the big bow and the fancy wig and the very sentimental way in which she looks towards uh, on a diagonal. But again, this is um, a much more somber background. Okay, it's much more restrained. So you can kind of see how it's a combination of the Rococo and this more severe intellectually inclined um, neoclassical. Uh, and she's not the only artist engaged in this. We have Chardon, okay? So you can kind of see how it is more serious subject matter and it is much more restrained than the Rococo that we looked at in the last lecture. 
but it is um, it is still sentimental, and you're still seeing somewhat frivolous clothing, etc. This is Gainsborough, right? So again, you have this emphasis on the land, um, but you still have these very frivolous outfits, etc. Um, okay, so then Hogarth is one that I want to um, highlight for you. So Hogarth is British and he uses um, natural settings, but also uh, natural representation, but also Rococo settings. And he is very focused on morals and um, he uh, dislikes um, the frivolity of the Rococo, um, and he really likes the satirical subjects. So here we see called uh, a print called Gin Lane from 1751 by Hogarth, and this is showing how people are corrupted by alcohol. Um, so this is uh, very poor people who have become alcoholics, and you can see that there is this lack of care for themselves, for their children, etc., because they're so focused on drink. All right, and then this is um, a series called Marriage a la Mode, and it depicts, um, you can see that this is a satirical version of the Rococo. Okay, so you see these fancy outfits. And this is a story of these two individuals being betrothed to each other or they're going to be married because it's beneficial for the parents. And then they don't get along. She is, um, you know, engaged in entertaining friends and he is visiting prostitutes. Um, and then this is his mistress here. Uh, she's about 11 and she has been infected with syphilis. Um, and so what you see here is taking her to the doctor. Um, and so basically this idea that uh, the nobility are corrupt and um, basically irredeemable, okay? And then we start to see affairs coming up and then um, the, uh, the husband or the one who had the really young mistress, this fellow here, um, comes across his wife having an affair and he's mortally wounded and then she, the wife commits suicide because her husband is dead and her lover has been hanged and you can see that she was also infected with syphilis from her husband's um, dalliances with prostitutes and you can see this in the child's de deform um, profile, as well as the black spot, which indicates cephalus. Okay, so although these look Rococo, um, they are not focused on pleasure and sensuality like we talked about with the Rococo. This is very much a lecture against um, the principles that we saw coming to the forefront in the Rococo. Okay, so we also have Benjamin West, who he depicts um, these very historical and grand subject matter, um, but he is still somewhat inclined towards the dramatic, and you can see it in the sweep here and um, the gesture. So this is the death of General Wolfe from 1770, um, and this is a this is technically neoclassical, um, and it's done in the grand manner. So you can see that this is a history painting, and what you're seeing here is the death of um, someone contemporary, but it is modern subjects with traditional message of patriotism and sacrifice. And you're seeing a very dynamic composition. Again, right, these diagonals, these gestures, the windswept nature of the clouds and the hair, um, as well as factual details. And so um, that is going to be pretty consistent in West's work. So again, you can see how there's this going back to classical themes, but it's not themes with putai everywhere. This is not love and romance and frivolity. This is much more serious. And here we see Benjamin Franklin drawing electricity from the sky. So this is the concept of Benjamin Franklin flying a kite in the middle of a thunderstorm in order to see what lightning is, figuring out about electricity. So again, you can see that there's this sort of emphasis on um, little 
almost putai, but they're not quite putai. They're helping Benjamin Franklin because he's divinely inspired, but they're not here for the purposes of love, etc. So um, the neoclassical is a counterpoint to the Rococo. So neo means new uh, and classical, right, is pointing back to antiquity. So neoclassical or neoclassicism is new classical work. So again, pointing back to antiquity. And this is due in part, this emphasis on count, being a counterpoint for the Rococo is due in part to the emphasis on rationality of the Enlightenment. So the geometric harmony of classical art and architecture is seen as embodying Enlightenment ideals. And you can see this here, right, in the structure behind these individuals and how austere it is, how severe, how heavy. Um, so this is a story of Cornelia, who her friend, who's depicted here in the red, um, comes over and she starts showing off her jewels. And then she asks Cornelia, where are your jewels? And Cornelia points to her children and says, these are my jewels. Okay, so again, this emphasis on virtue and patriotism and family. And so this is what the ideal woman should be. She should not be focused on jewels and playthings, but rather on raising a virtuous family, etc. And so um, this is another female painter, Angelica Kaufman. And you can see how there is some element of sentimentality. But again, we have these very severe outfits. This is Cupid and Psyche. So the son of Venus um, with the woman that he falls in love with. And um, you can see that in the background, we have some of this emphasis on the natural art that we saw before with Gainsborough, um, et cetera. But again, this emphasis on the more severe subject matter. And um, again, Ang is another example of this mediation between the two. Um, and so he is someone who is willing to distort the human body to achieve elegance. Um, but he's also focused on um, neoclassical ideals. So here we see uh, a nude female. This is called the Grande Odalesque or um, Une Odalesque. So an Odalesque is a reclining nude female. Um, here we see the apotheosis of Homer. So Homer is the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay, um, so again, this neoclassical emphasis. Um, okay, so even though we do have some of the more natural backgrounds and um, some drama inherent in the compositions. But one element of neoclassicism, and this is predominant in Europe and the US, the end of the 18th to the early 19th century. So roughly 1750 to 1830. And the neoclassical includes what's called the Grand Tour. And so this is a tour of Italy and it's a focus on art and culture as well as examples of neoclassical art. It could take years. Rome is the main focus by mid-century. And so at this time, people are starting to excavate Roman um, settlements, okay? So you're starting to discover Pompeii. And so you're starting to become really interested in uh, the classical period. And so this is the Etruscan Room by Robert Adam, um, 1761. And it existed in a different state, but then Robert Adam was brought in to completely revamp. And you can see how it is echoing some of the classical themes. It is much more spare. Um, we have very austere uh, archaeological elements. Um, this is the Pantheon or Saint Genevieve in Paris. And this is 1757 to 92. So again, you see this emphasis on the classical building style, okay? And we briefly mentioned this with um, a question came up in one of the classes about neoclassical architecture like uh, the American Capitol or the White House, okay? And so we're going to be seeing this return to the severity um, the mathematical elements, the logic of classical art. And so what we see here is Chiswick House, 
um, by Richard Boyle, 1725 to 29. Okay, and you can still see how this is very much aggrandized. Look how huge these columns are. But you have this return to the very severe forms of um, the classical, but also the early Renaissance in Italy. Okay, so this is. Um, it's not quite classical because you can see these big expanses of just empty space. So this emphasis on severity. Okay, so these are studies of antique art. So they are not slavish copies, but rather imitations. And they emphasize noble grandeur and calm simplicity. And they tend to portray um, heroic, morally uplifting themes if they are um, interiors or if they are paintings or statues. And again, this is a reaction to the, quote, frivolous and unedifying subject matter of Rococo art. And so there's a return to artists like Raphael and Poussin. Um, stoic themes, austere composition, and the dignity and grandeur of the art before the Rococo, okay? Um, and so by 1755, the father of art history, Winkelmann, he says that the only way for modern people to become great and perhaps unequaled is by imitating the ancients. And so this is something that's really interesting because this concept of returning to the past appeals to a broad range of ideologies um, including the founding fathers of the US and Louis the 16th, okay? So oh, we have this awareness that there's more than one historical style. And so we're seeing Middle Eastern as well as Egyptian and Greek art because of this interest in archeology. span So here we have some elements of um, Greek, but we also have Egyptian in these little Sphinx figures. Okay, so there's really this combination of these ideas. But what sets neoclassicism apart from past revivals of antiquity is also the concept of modernity. So new inventions that are coming to the forefront, etc. Um, and it's a quest for a timeless mode of expression. So this is seen as the true style. Um, and for many, it is uh, the complexity and the opulence of the Baroque art is associated with the flamboyant rule of the mon absolute monarchy, which is something that becomes very negative. And we're going to see that in the various revolutions that arise. So here's Monticello designed by Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so again, hopefully you recognize this is the Hall of Mirrors um, from 1735-ish, and this is Rococo. Remember how we talked about the natural forms and the curving lines and the arabesques and the putai and the gold and the sheer level of decoration, right? So Rococo, everything about this screams Rococo. And then in contrast, we have the stark simplicity of Monticello. Um, we have La Madeleine, which is in Paris, and this is designed in 1806. Okay, so you can really see how it's this return to the um, uh, artistic ideals of antiquity. So again, here is an example of the Baroque. Okay, so this is the portrait of Louis XIV or the Sun King by Rigaud from 1702. And we talked about the opulence and the grandeur and the fact that he is establishing himself as the supreme authority in France. He is divinely appointed. He is the absolute monarch. In contrast, this is a neoclassical outfit of the time. Okay. And you can just see how drastically different. So the emphasis on the legs. So I mentioned how the Sun King had originally been a dancer and he was very proud of how shapely his legs were. But he also has this incredibly grand fur and velvet and gold thread um, cape sort of thing. And he has this fancy lace collar and puff sleeves and gold and high heeled shoes. And in contrast, 1790, this is what a man's outfit would look like. It's very buttoned down, literally. <laughs> um, and it's very simple, it's very plain, it's very stark. 
And that is the sort of outfit that we're going to see for individuals like George Washington. So this is from 1785. This is by Houdin. And this is um, uh, Washington as um, Cincinnatus. And you can see here that there is a bundle of these rods which symbolize right the colonies etc so there's a lot of symbolism um, interestingly enough this was um, commissioned to memorialize george washington um, in 1841 by greeno but it was seen as being a little bit too much so this is elevating george washington to the status of a god. So he basically looks like Zeus here, and he's seen as, as topless. And this actually was not popular, um, interestingly enough. So they wanted much more refined and restrained um, in this sort of tradition. So this was created well before um, the Greeno piece, but uh, the um, Hodan was much preferred. Okay, and so we're going to see um, sculptures like Cupid and Psyche from Canova, 1794 to 99. And you can see that the setting that it is in even mimics um, the Etruscan room that we saw by Robert Adam. Okay, so again, this return to classical forms while uh, incorporating um, various elements of, say, Egyptian um, uh, imagery. Okay. So the last person that I want to discuss before we take a look at the French Revolution and David is Stubbs. So George Stubbs is self-taught um, and he studied in hospitals and he taught human anatomy and um, he is a union of the arts and the sciences and he is very very focused on the biology and the anatomy of figure and he becomes basically a horse painter and he paints these works in incredibly, incredibly detailed manners. They're incredibly accurate. Okay, so what we're seeing here is a rearing horse from 1762. And if you remember, this is the swing, okay? This is 1767. So these works are being produced almost simultaneously. And um, Stubbs was incredibly scientific in the way that he approached um, the depiction of anatomy. And so what we are seeing here is the result of study of the physiology, the physique of horses. And so the way that he would um, study horses was he, uh, it's quite macabre, but he had meat hooks in a barn and he would hang dead horses from there and he would slowly strip them so that he could study each layer, right? So the veins, the tissues, the musculature, the skin, the bones. Um, and this is something that, again, is kind of similar to what we saw in the Renaissance and the Baroque where the dissection of humans was extremely important and it was practiced by people like Leonardo da Vinci, um, Rembrandt depicted dissections, etc. Okay, so this real emphasis on the um, specificity and, excuse me, the biology of um, horses accurately. So again, right, keep in mind that he publishes a book called The Anatomy of Horses, um, and it doesn't have backgrounds. It's just the anatomy of these horses, and it is published one year before the swing. Okay, so just think about these differing ideals that we have going on. Now, admittedly, the swing is French, whereas Stubbs is British. And so we do have different countries coming into play, um, but it is just worth considering that these things are all occurring at the same time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the French Revolution, and then we'll dive into David. Um, and discuss why the neoclassical period started to wane. So the French Revolution is from 1789 to 1799, and it's carried forward by Napoleon during the expansion of the French Empire. And basically it overthrows the monarchy to establish a republic, but eventually it becomes a dictatorship under Napoleon who is eventually exiled and it triggers the global decline of absolute monarchies. 
So what causes the French Revolution? You have things like the Seven Years' War and the American Revolutionary War, which causes the French government to be deeply in debt. Okay, so you also have the grandeur of someone like the Sun King who um, had Versailles, right? So let me just um, uh, bring up Versailles again so that you can kind of remember the grandeur. And we spoke about how thousands of people lived here, right? Um, and so the opulence and the fact that this Hall of Mirrors um, is made of extremely expensive material at the time. Everything is coated in gold and it's extremely opulent. So this is the Sun King. Um, and the revolution does not occur during the Sun King's um, rule, but it happens to um, his descendants. And so Marie Antoinette is on the throne at the time of the revolution. Okay, but consider all the money that would have to go into something like this. And so there are years of bad harvest. So there is starvation, there is famine. Um, and so the lower classes become extremely resentful of someone living in this situation, right? Someone who is so focused on material pleasures um, while people can't even get something simple like food. Um, so there is a quote that is um, misinterpreted uh, and attributed to Marie Antoinette that says, let them eat cake. So um, supposedly the way the story goes is that she was approached by an advisor and informed that the people did not have bread. And so she said, let them eat cake, which is very decadent at this time because sugar is expensive and it's imported, um, all this information. So you have this level of resentment from the lower classes towards the nobility um, and the royalty. So um, I mentioned that we have the French government deeply in debt, but they do not try to restrain their spending. Um, royalty continues to have very grand balls and there would be hairstyles created for Marie Antoinette that would cost a year's wages, okay? Um, and the government decides that the best way to get the money back because they're in debt is to impose heavy taxation schemes. So they're saying that people have to pay a lot of taxes, but exempt from having to pay these taxes, apologies, um, are the nobility and the clergy. Okay, so this is all going on to the middle class and the lower classes, okay? So the Enlightenment comes around and they say that the government is here to serve the people. And if the government does not do that, then they should be overthrown by revolution, okay? So this is a really, really big change. So in 1789, you have what's called the third estate. So this is the bourgeoisie. So people who have some money um, as well as the peasantry and urban and rural workers who rise up against the first estate, which is clergy, and the second estate, which is nobility. So these are social and economic, so socioeconomic rankings. So you have the lowest class rising up against the upper two. And they abolish feudalism, which is the concept of farming land that is not yours um, for rent. And then the same people own the land and the same people engage in subsistence farming and starve and are peasants. Um, and so this is abolished. And in 1792, uh, a republic is proclaimed in France. And this leads in 1793 to 1794 to the reign of terror. And so the reign of terror had some good things, like they abolished slavery in the French colonies. Um, they established price controls on food and other items so that you weren't having price gouging. Um, they also sought to de-Christianize society by creating a new calendar and expelling religious figures. Okay, so think about the fact that I said that the first estate or the highest socioeconomic class under royalty is the clergy. Okay, so you have very wealthy clergy, and it's kind of like um, Martin Luther's 
uh, ire with the church for the fact that they are focused on money and material possessions. Um, and so these figures are expelled and the borders are secured. And between 16,000 and 40,000 civilians are actually executed in this one year period, this reign of terror. Um, and that ends in 1794, but eventually in 1799, the ruling body is overthrown by Napoleon who establishes a dictatorship. So let's come back to David. So David is um, basically the official artist for the revolution in France. And he um, is very interested in the Enlightenment and neoclassical ideas. And he believes strongly that artwork should have a moral. So we're not creating something frivolous and fun just for the sake of pleasure or for um, visual appeal, right? It must be moralizing. And he appreciates the ancients and classical education um, the level of archaeological exactitude that is present in the study of ancient cultures. Um, and he actually studied in Italy for five years. So what we see here is an extremely famous painting called The Oath of the Harati. Um, so the original of this is in the Louvre, um, but this version is actually in the Toledo Museum of Art, which is only about an hour from Detroit. Uh, and it's a free museum. I would highly encourage you to go there if you get the chance. Um, so basically artists would have these big workshops and they would have people who are apprenticed so that they could train to be artists, but they would also work on paintings for the artist. Um, and so artists were able to churn out many, many versions of the same painting because they became so popular. So this is from 1786. So it predates the French Revolution by only three years. And this is the Oath of the Harati. And so this is a subject matter of Horace seen here. He's the father or the patriarch. Um, and the men here are swearing to protect Rome to the death from people, uh, another family called the Curiati, okay? So you see here the father of the Harati and then his sons, the Harati here. And they're all swearing um, fidelity and patriotism, right? And this is the most important value. It comes above family. It comes above everything else. What you see here on the right are these women who look extremely downcast. And the reason for that is that these are the sisters and wives of the Harati. And one of these um, Harati women is engaged to a Curiati. And one of these women is married to a Harati, but she comes from the Curiati family. And so these men are really pledging devotion to um, saving Rome above all else, even if it means killing um, their brother-in-law etc. or the fiance of their sister. And so you can see that we have these very classical outfits um, that are being depicted. So this is a scene from ancient Rome. We have this incredibly severe architecture, right, with these columns and these arches. There's no decoration whatsoever. Um, and this was a subject matter that had actually recently been uh, made into a play and put on the stage. And so we see a very stage-like setting. This almost has the appearance of a set and it is a very shallow space. But this serves as a rallying point for Republicans during the French Revolution. So the people who are rising up um, and what you see are these very angular and um, harsh men. And what you see with the women are very soft and melting and curving. And so this is uh, very intentional. So the men are hard and angular. And this has to do with the values that are ideal for men. Whereas the women are much more curving and emotional and soft. And again, this points back to a virtuous woman. Okay, so they are devoted to family. Um, and they are devoted to raising the citizens of this country, okay? So very, very important at this time. You can see how this is incredibly moralizing. 
Um, so again, right, just to point back to the Rococo and the very strong difference. So you can see again how frothy and the emphasis on pleasure and the putai here. Now, admittedly, there is a difference of about 70 years, but remember that the Rococo continues into the 1760s and beyond, right? Think of the swing from 1767, I believe. Okay, and just compare these and the much harsher colors, how you don't have blending, okay, the harsh lighting. So just keep in mind how drastic this shift is. This is another very famous work by David. Um, and to clarify, it's pronounced David, but it looks like David. And this is because he's French. So this is the death of Marat. And this is from 1793. And so this is a very dark palette because it's not frivolous. What is depicted here is a writer for the Republic um, who had really bad skin conditions. And so he had to soak in this very medicinal bath quite often. And you can see that he is writing. Um, he is furthering the cause of the Republic. And a woman gained admittance to his quarters under pretense and then stabbed him and he died in his bath. So that's what's being depicted here. Um, and the figure is based on Michelangelo's Pieta. Okay, so consider how this is elevating this figure, this man. Um, he becomes a martyr for the cause and he is being compared to a Christian martyr. Um, so it's really very explicit, but look how restrained. This is a mortal wound that we see here, um, but it is not dramatized. It's a very simple cut and there is a little bit of blood, but nothing like you would expect, right? Think of the drama inherent in Caravaggio's Judith and Holofernes. Whoop, helps if you spell Judith properly right? And the, the blood that's just spurting out um, compared with the restraint of uh, David, okay? So again, right? So this is the epitome of neoclassicism. It is subdued. It is restrained. It's an emphasis on patriotism, um, and it is very austere, okay? And the last painting by David that I want to show you is the coronation of Napoleon and Josephine. So what you see here is Napoleon, um, and he is in the process of crowning Josephine. And I wanted to bring this to your attention again because this did make an appearance in the music video that we watched at the start of the, um, the semester. And Napoleon actually crowned himself because he believed that no one was above him. And so he had the right to crown himself. And here you see him crowning his wife, Josephine. And yes, they are wearing very grand um, costumes, but it is still much more restrained. And you can see that the fashions have changed drastically. So this is what's known even today as an empire waist gown. And so Napoleon's rule is known as empire. And so these are um, uh, an amalgamation or a combination of contemporary combined with classical dress. Um, so if you've ever seen um, a production of Jane Austen, you'll notice that they often wear these empire style dresses, right? So this is just to kind of tie these things together and show you how um, all these histories combine. And as we saw in the music video, this is massive, right? And so you can see how it is really glorifying Napoleon and his rule. Um, and so David is much loved by Napoleon, okay? So by the beginning of the 19th century or the early 1800s, we start to see neoclassicism waning or declining, okay? So the empire um, exists through, the empire style exists through um, Napoleon's reign, and then he is exiled and eventually dies in exile. And I believe the empire style goes to about 1815. And then we see a fast plummet. 
um, of the neoclassical style. And so um, there is a concern for fidelity to archaeological finds, which inhibits imaginative experimentation and originality of vision. So this means that artists start to become constrained by the very things that they are hoping to emulate. So because they're trying to be so accurate um, in their depictions, they're starting to run out of creative expression and the paintings start to become um, somewhat monotonous and uninteresting. Okay. Um, and what originally started as a style inspired by principles of republicanism under Napoleon I becomes a language of imperial opulence. So basically, um, this is moving away from the principles that were originally behind neoclassicism. And you can see that in the clothing here, right? So compare the, um, the cloak worn by Josephine and by uh, Napoleon as well, right? So what we're looking at here is ermine, which is the same material as um, the portrait of uh, Louis the 14th here. Okay, and so you can start to see how Napoleon would become um, similar to the monarchy in the way that he rules. Okay, and so there is this distinct decline of the style of neoclassicism, which has become this very opulent thing. Okay, um, so in the next uh, lecture, we're going to look at Romanticism which is, um, again, the pendulum swinging against uh, neoclassicism and the severity and the, the emphasis on logic. And so we're going to see a lot of that in art history. Hopefully you're picking up on that, that you, you are here and then the pendulum swings really hard and then it just keeps swinging back and forth and back and forth. Um, and so I think that's fascinating and I hope you find it interesting too. Okay, 